Hello, I'm Max Rempel. I will talk today about DNA resonance and electromagnetic therapy. So there will be three parts, and the first part I will talk mostly about DNA resonance, and then we'll go from there. And I will take questions after each part, if there will be any. So there are uh, several ways to test uh, electromagnetic signaling between the uh, biological objects and from biological objects. So um, the simplest one is to take two petri dishes, put some um, embryos there, like fish, fish eggs, or um, or just cells, and see if the cells in two petri dishes are talking to each other. And I have to say, all of these methods have been tried and produced positive results. So basically, if you just have two petri dishes with embryos, they talk to each other, especially well if you have their <clears throat> containers made out of quartz. So it would, if you take two quartz containers, like um, spectroscopy cuvettes, then um, the cells talk to each other or embryos. The second thing is um, you can do you can block the communication and demonstrate that if you put a, like an electromagnetic shield, like foil between the, the cuvettes, then the signaling stops. And that has been shown too. Mostly these are Russian experiments, but there are experiments in other countries as well. And that has been published and reproduced. It's kind of pretty well reproduced, but not, not, not much known. And then uh, you can put a filter and try to figure out which kind of waves are transmitting the signal. And so when they're transmitting the signal, what do you do? You, you treat the first um, uh, cuvette with one, um, uh, with one, um, you treat the first cuvette with one um, treatment, like um, it can be a stress and then see, or a virus and they see if the second caveat is uh, uh, is responding. Or you can take, uh, there are experiments where they take older embryos and younger embryos and show that there is effect between the two. And then you can put a filter and see which wavelength is responsive. <clears throat> also there are uh, waveguides. So you can put a, a waveguide and show that the effect is there. And so these are mostly experiments by um, Gurvich and Burlakov, I will talk about them a bit later. And then there are experiments where I could put a mirror and amazingly some mirrors have an effect. So when the embryos see themselves through, through a mirror, which is selective to certain wavelengths, there is also an effect. Um, then also there is a participation with the device. So you can measure the waves from their living objects using the device. And this would be very sensitive devices, but Modern photo multipliers do the job. So there are some biophotons coming out of the biological objects, especially the growing ones like, like fish eggs or uh, frog eggs or drosophila eggs and so on. Uh, then um, if, you, if you record this and uh, recreate and amplify and shine it onto the growing embryos, you can see the, if there is an effect. So that has been done as well. And also maybe you don't record it, you just directly record in one place, uh, hmm, detect in one place using the device and then amplify and send on another uh, biological object. So the, the, the ways to test whether it's um, electromagnetic signaling between um, their biological objects. So um, the pioneer of the field is Alexander Gurvich. And um, his main action was in early 10s and 20s of the last century. So in 1912, he started the experiments and first uh, discoveries were, were around uh, 1917 and then around in 1922, he published and um, his experiments were reproduced and he was nominated for a Nobel Prize 11 times, never got it. And I think that 
to change the history because um, the mainstream science rejected his discoveries and, and kind of they were buried. So he had a lab. Um, he moved to Russia during the revolution and um, he was very um, wise to uh, make a lab away from, from the capital. It was in, in Crimea, in Simferopol. So he had a lab very successful from uh, Around seventeen, oh, around nineteen seventeen to about to exactly nineteen forty eight, when um, there were repressions and Lysenko uh, basically used political power to crush a lot of positive science, including genetics, including this field which could be called. Um, hmm, Resonance biology, uh, wave biology, electromagnetic biology, uh, biophysics, uh, wave biophysics, that kind of uh, science. So, so um, Gurvich proposed the idea of morphogenic field. And he actually discovered it, his lab discovered it, and it was reproduced. Uh, the, the reason it's called morphogenic, morpho stands for shape of the body or shape of the embryo. And uh, genic means producing. So the field which produces the shape. Um, the current mainstream theory is that, and it's proven, it's proven that chemicals are responsible for, genes and chemicals are responsible for the shape of the body. The most famous experiments about morphogenes, which are, which are, um, which are genes, uh, which, which are defined in the shape of the um, drosophila fly, fruit fly. And if you turn some of them off or switch them, then the shape is uh, mutated to, so you can have uh, extra eyes or extra wings at any part of the body or extra legs. So, so this is pretty, pretty much proven. And at that moment, the second part of the hypothesis is that in addition to the chemistry, there is also a an electromagnetic component or field component. The second part, the field part was um, buried and um, and it's not accepted by the mainstream science. So we are talking now about fringe alternative science. At the time of Gurwich, it was not yet decided. So this was um, a free, a well-respected uh, line of research investigation. So his main, uh, most known experiment is using you see the onion here, and there are growing roots, and it's a good model because the root of the onion, or many other plants, grows really fast. But in the onion, there is a lot of nutrients, so it's very easy, clean experiment where you have growing roots, and the end of the root is growing really fast. And then they um, use the prism to uh, take the light from the growing root and. Um, split the light into wavelengths. So the light is uh, reflected and separated into different wavelengths. And then um, you can treat the other route or usually they use the yeast culture in, in the dishes, in Petri dishes and show that um, the waves from the growing root are speeding up, they were speeding up the mitosis, mitosis division of the, of the yeast culture. So, uh, uh, so one plant was affecting another single cell eukaryote organism. And this radiation was called mitogenic because um, mitosis is the division. So mitogenic speeding up the mitosis. And they found the the, the spectral lines were around 200 nanometers, which is soft ultraviolet and very weak. Uh, and here we also kind of um, <clears throat> could guess that it, DNA is involved because that's the area where DNA is strongly absorbing the, uh, the waves. Uh, DNA in a cell is one of the strongest absorbents of the absorbers of the, um, soft ultraviolet light. 
All right, and they were, then were they were just able to map exact the positions of different of different um, bands of this light, and then show that these positions were affected by the um, quality and by different types of um, treatments, and also by what is capturing it. So all all of that was um, investigated. So they did a lot of investigations for years, and then after closing of the lab in 1962 it was reopened uh, by his daughter Anna and uh, the experiments were reproduced so the school kind of continued and um, I'll go to the next slide and now there is a lab of Burlakov and uh, he is expanding these experiments repeating and expanding instead of the onion he uses um, fish fertilized fish eggs so early stage embryo from one cell to to multiple cells, and um, <clears throat> he shows the effects that one one, um, one group of embryos affects an, uh, another. And interesting uh, to me was that uh, germanium mirror would, uh, if you, if the eggs just see themselves in germanium mirror, there is acceleration of the growth and. Um, And if they see themselves in um, uh, a prism called retroreflector, UV prism, you see that's corner cube re retroreflector, it kind of turns the image around. Uh, then there is repression and abnormalities. And then abnormalities, uh, developmental abnormalities are very important because it shows that we are dealing with morphogenic field, which defines the shape of the, of the body, shape of the development. So these experiments started in around 70s, 80s and continue to this day. And um, I'm in contact, indirect contact with that group and we are learning more from, from them about how to do it and what waves are involved. So the fact, so this is one of the strongest experimental proofs we, we got. So it's, it's still, um, not accepted by mainstream, but it's published and ac accessible. And there are many, many experiments, hmm, tens of experiments published by different groups confirming that it is real. So uh, that is a, <laughs> as good as we get usually uh, in, in this area of the science. Now I am, uh, I have masters in uh, DNA chemistry from, 90, uh, from 1986, PhD in molecular biology 94. Both of these were like on um, chemistry of DNA and then uh, using DNA for um, uh, in biological experiments. And I did postdoc, uh, postdoctoral work in America from 96 for 10 years. And this was mostly genomics using human genome, mouse genome, gene regulation, and animal models. Uh, and then from uh, 2008 till now, I'm uh, running biomedical startups and get funded for therapeutics, for therapeutic electromagnetic devices uh, targeting DNA. Uh, my initiation in this, okay. So I should mention that DNA is very tangible. It's not something ethereal, not something uh, unreal. It, Many, many like thousands or even tens or hundreds of thousands of scientists see the DNA every day in our experiments. And the way we see it is, you know, we can extract it. We see the white precipitate. We can write it on a gel. We see the cloud, colored cloud under ultraviolet. So it's, it's a real substance. It's not something, and we have a lot of DNA. It's, it's not something ethereal. It's very, very, you know, we can have a, a jar of DNA with, which is very tangible. And also the sequence of the DNA is very um, digital. It's one of the most um, discrete things in biology. Everything else is fuzzy and um, ethymeric where it's hard to catch it. It's very mutable, but the DNA is very stable. Um, we can still sequence the DNA from dinosaurs. It's so stable, it survived for uh, Mm, a million of years. Sequencing is very precise because of the very interesting structure of DNA. So DNA 
uh, complementary traits paired together in a very precise manner. Uh, and that's how we reproduce and we resemble our parents. The um, uh, replication of DNA is precise. So DNA, when, when the two strands come together, they recognize the sequence of each other. So that is used for the research and uh, typical methods are sequencing of DNA, genotyping, which is sequencing specific points of the person and gen genome of the person. We can synthesize DNA very easily. We can now manipulate the sequence of the organism. Like we can create mice or plants with the exact uh, modification. So we can edit it in a computer and order and it's reasonably cheap to produce a modified organism. So uh, experimentation with DNA is very easy. And as I said, hundreds of thousands of scientists are I just doing that and get results from that. So you can experiment with DNA sequence. All right, and um, what is not known? So biological development, which is development of the embryo, how we get from one cell to our shape is not well understood. So the chemical part is understood, the, the genes are important, the chemistry is important, but, um, say if we give a sequence, genomic sequence to scientists without giving them sort of a way to cheat, they wouldn't be able to predict what will come out of the genomic sequence. Sometimes they could tell that it is possibly just by looking at it, it's possibly a bacteria and not mammal, but uh, you cannot tell the mouse from a human just by structure of the sequence. The language of the genomic sequence is not understood. Um, also, <clears throat> it was shown that if you mess up the genome, then uh, development and the shape of the body is messed up. But um, only only that there, the the details of the of the development are still um, pretty much a mystery. <clears throat> and moreover, um, we believe that. Hold on a second. All right, we believe that <clears throat> uh, it's, it's insufficient. So if you look at current mechanisms which explain the development, I don't think the chemis chemical component is insufficient. I believe there is more, more to it. All right, next, um, uh, brainwave patterns are connected to DNA. I'll explain why, but brainwave patterns uh, are not understood either. So reading the brain pattern, brainwave patterns only allows you to tell if the person is active or passive. And sometimes if you use MRI, you can read a little bit of the, um, which part of the brain is active, but, but that's where it ends. Basically, we cannot really tell from brain, brain wave pattern, you know, electroencephalogram, we cannot tell the thoughts or can read the language. It is an, an area which is actively researched, but I believe uh, there is something there which is to be discovered very profound. <clears throat> Next problem with the genome is there is not enough genes to, it's only about 21,000 protein coding genes, maybe another 40,000 of protein non coding genes, but so making only RNA, not protein. So there is not enough genes to explain complexity. So we have uh, simple organisms have about the same number of genes, very comparable, like yeast, very simple, and uh, it's a very comparable number of genes. So the complexity is not in the, in the genes. And there is not, an, and, and, uh, and then size of the genome is about three gigabyte size, more precisely three gigabases, three billion nucleotides. It's not big enough to explain the complexity of the, of us. So there is not enough genes, there is not enough complexity in the genome. So there is something missing is there. And not, not enough genes is most pronounced uh, 
that the, the genome is not enough, only, if, only a few people have noticed, but the, the number of genes is not enough, number of genes is not enough. Many scientists are surprised and still a puzzle. How is, is it possible to develop such a complexity with the, such a small number of genes? Of course, the main logical conclusion, much of the complexity should be in uh, so-called junk DNA or non-coding DNA and um, it, it's not understood. So that is a problem to be resolved. And obviously my hint is uh, the waves are important. The DNA resonance is important and it is in non-coding part of the genome. And obviously the mechanisms are incomplete. So chemical mechanism cannot explain everything, right? Mm. So these are just explain, uh, want to demonstrate that um, the genome is available online. And if you just go to UCC genome browser, you can see our genome and genomes of tens of other organisms like mouse, cow, dog, and so on. It's heavily annotated. So there is a good job done by many universities. And this one is just easiest to use UCC browser. You can see where the genes are. So if you see this little uh, vertical bars, these are the coordinate parts of the DNA. And between them, there are introns which are non-coding. And uh, this is non-coding part of the genome. So there is a lot of non-coding part. And then uh, you can compare the sequences of human, mouse, dog, elephant, chicken, and so on. So we are similar in some ways and we are different in some ways. Um, you can see some common SNPs which are point mutations and you can see Repetitive elements. So signs are very popular repetitive, repetitive elements in our genome. They make mm, total together, I think about maybe between 10 and 20%, more like 15% of the genome are signs. Uh, and lines are another maybe 7% of our genome. So lots of the genome is repetitive and it's very poorly studied. All right, so you can even zoom the genome to the nucleotide level and you can see T, 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 A, C, C, T, A, G, T, 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 G, A, A, T, C, T. So you get the point. So there is 3 billion of those. And it's not that much. It's, you know, it's uh, comparable to the size of your operating system on Android. Android maybe is uh, less than gigabyte and here you have three gigabytes. So I would say genome is not enough to, to explain the complexity of us. <clears throat> So the sequences are available. Now we go to the earliest um, reference I found about um, electromagnetic genome, holographic genome, the resonant part of the genome. So Richard Allen Miller, um, I did a couple of interviews, he is wonderful. And uh, my interviews are online. I, um, uh, so it was about, 73, about 30, over 40 years ago, I think he, over 40 years ago, he published a paper where he outlined main principles of the uh, holographic genome of the role of DNA. And basically those principles still stand. I will focus on them for the rest of the, of the conversation. So, so a lot of things were pronounced. And the main thing was that in, in addition to chemistry, there is a, an electromagnetic component of the of the regulation of the creation of the field. Uh, you can call it mor morphic field, morphogenic field, or uh, uh, etheric field, astral field. So DNA is involved in creating the field, communicating with the field, and the DNA is physical substance. It creates the field, and then the field um, uh, does the rest of the work. Okay, um, Peter Grave, um, 21 years later, 73 to 94, published a, a book, uh, The Wave Genome. And that's when, uh, and I got this book only in 99. So that's 1999 was the time I was introduced to this idea. I was interested before, but I wasn't aware. So mm, I, I went the standard way of research for uh, a number of years. 
And for about four years, I did heavy work in experimental um, in uh, human genetics within the system. I was doing postdocs in one lab and then in another lab. So we did a lot of genotyping of humans and we knew a lot about their uh, psychology, psychiatry, preferences, behaviors. Um, so I was working, I had a, an access to the a collection of samples of well-characterized volunteers uh, who were who answered all the questions, questionnaires, and you know we knew the psychological profile pretty well. And I was genotyping most interesting candidate SNPs, which are point mutations, what variations these people had. And at some point, I realized that the genetic mutations we were looking at didn't correlate too much, it didn't define much the preferences of the people. So I was, um, at that point, I had a crisis of scientific understanding why the hypothesis doesn't work, why the mutations in famous genes don't make a lot of difference. And that's when I went first to the hypothesis of astrology, and then I was given that book by a friend, out of nowhere, like, um, uh, just an acquaintance, a nice um, person, Natasha Kupriyanova, just said, gave the book and said, maybe I might be interested. And I asked if it, what it is, and they said, you know, that our director uh, doesn't approve it. He, he said, maybe there are good ideas there, but there is also lots of junk in this book. And I completely agree. There are good ideas, but lots of junk. In the previous, in the previous book, in Alan Miller's uh, paper, it's pure gold in... Uh, Garev's book, there is um, too much uh, good ideas mixed up with um, um, unclear thinking and unclear presentation. So it, it was hard to get it. But the main gist is there that the genome is holographic and it uh, uh, works through the waves. Later I found, um, and I know, uh, I know also Garev, I spoke to him a couple of times and uh, he kind of blessed me uh, in my endeavor, so he supports, remotely supports the, you know, my, my investigation. Um, Marka Bischoff um, from Germany wrote his book in German. He is more like a journalist, but in 95 he published uh, the book where he mentioned DNA and also there was, so, so he, it's another person who uh, is believing in holographic nature of DNA and uh, the role in morphogenesis, morphogenesis and uh, photons, the role of the photons in the brain. So everything is mentioned here. DNA, brain, photons, morphogenesis, holography. Next, we just found recently, my group is uh, still digging, and um, a very good uh, book by um, Constantine Mail. I communicated with him. Uh, not as successfully he responded, but um, basically uh, uh, it wasn't that easy to, to get him to cooperate. But I think if, uh, if there are money around, I think he would be more interested in, uh, in continuing to consult and research. So he wrote a book and he has very interesting theory on the physics side of it. And he, uh, the main problem um, we are solving is that DNA is uh, bathing in a very um, dense soup of um, very uncertain shapes. DNA has an uncertain shape in a bigger, like the primary DNA is very certain, it's very spiral, very clean, but it is bathing in a very uh, amorphous, unshaped um, uh, milieu. And, um, and how, and, and this milieu is distorting the communications. It's um, it's not very friendly to clean uh, waves like electronics. You cannot send a wave and receive it on the other side. If you send some wave through the body, like gamma rays would penetrate and go in and out without interfering. The radio waves would go in and out without leaving much. And the light and infrared would get stuck. UV will be absorbed on the top layer of the skin and millimeter waves will be also absorbed on the top layer of the skin. So there is nothing which would resonate clearly with the, with the body. 
there is a, that is a big problem. And um, Constantine Mayer solves it by explaining that the waves which are produced and used by biolog biological objects are unusual. They are very comfortable with uh, shape changes. And they, he called them scalar waves, but you can call them some other way. It's, as I understand what he says, those waves are primarily uh, helical and helical with an even uh, step. It's, so it's, if DNA is very evenly spaced, the, the waves Constantine Mayer describes are kind of have um, nuts and stretches and they don't have to be regular. So he talks about irregular electromagnetic waves of helical vortex nature. And apparently there is a lot of physics which can be built just on that which is wonderful. I think it's a great explanation. I, I like it. I think he, he made a big um, input in, in, in answering that question. Now, uh, I should mention Jacques Benveniste and Luc Montagnier. Uh, Jacques discovered um, the role of electromagnetic um, transmission between uh, biological objects by doing exactly the experiment I showed before where you take the, uh, create the waves and take the waves from one object, send it to another and transmit some biological information. And um, he was um, not lucky enough to, um, to play it right. So his uh, research was also closed. His lab was sort of, um, his, the finding of his lab dried out and uh, he, he died very soon after, as usual. I don't know if he died for natural reasons or not, but he died very soon after. And it was about 35 or so years ago. I think it was around maybe 80 something or early 90s or late 80s, maybe. Uh, and, and, uh, you can Google it in, in uh, Wikipedia. And uh, his research was picked up uh, by Luc Montagnier and uh, Luc added the DNA component there. So he demonstrated that um, you can uh, take the DNA, record some electromagnetic pattern from the DNA. So excite it, record the pattern, transmit, record on the, or record the pattern on the computer, transmit elsewhere, and um, recreate that pattern elsewhere. And uh, test it in a, in a biochemical way. I, I wish to reproduce, these experiments are very interesting. I wish to be able to reproduce them. That's, um, that's exciting. And uh, the, design, the design of the experiments was very simplistic. So I, I like it a lot. Now, uh, this was my talk in um, 2003. So it's 15 years ago. And um, here I just ended a little bit mentioning the chromatin. So I think everybody knows that chromatin is there. So. Chromatin is there, DNA is wrapped around nucleosomes. And this is not a very good uh, picture of nucleosomes because later I noticed that although they painted as uh, say tall, tall bars, they're actually very short. They're more like, um, they're proportion, they are very short. They're thick, uh, wide and short. Uh, so, um, the message, the idea was showing that there is a chemical signal. So this is a protein uh, binding to the DNA. And DNA is known to be wrapped in uh, eukaryotes. It's wrapped around nucleosomes, like a protein core, and DNA is wrapped around. So the protein binds to this DNA structure. And uh, it should use the energy to send. So like our cell phones, they use um, electric charge to, to, to generate um, electromagnetic signal. So I assume the same should be true for the, for the DNA. It should use some protein as a signal and ATP as the energy. It should be some uh, protein factory um, transforming this energy into a meaningful message. This message is sent from one cell to another cell. Also, it could be sent within the cell. And then the, the second uh, DNA received the, uh, the DNA in the second cell receives the message. Also uses ATP, basically the chemical energy to transmit a weak message into a stronger signal. So it should be very specific. And like our cell phone, again, 
use the electrical energy to receive the message and convert it into something tangible. And in our case, it is light and sound. Well, that's what the phone does. And also it vibrates. So it's even a little bit of mechanical vibration. And in case of DNA, it, uh, the main function, chemical function of DNA is to create RNA. So I show here that uh, RNA is created. So uh, protein signal is received. Uh, RNA is synthesized. So that was pretty much the um, the idea back then, and uh, <laughs> it's now kind of obvious. But but th that is the basis of of the DNA resonance idea. So there is a a conversation going on using some specific signaling between uh, between the cells, and possibly between the bodies, and possibly within the cells. So here we come to the main uh, summary slide of this um, of this talk. So here the DNA uh, creates a field which is we can call morphogenic field, and uh, Sheldrake called it morphic field. Um, and then this morphic field goes in, and and the conversation is always goes in two directions. So DNA makes a field, but also the field talks to the DNA. And this morphic field um, is working in uh, by organizing, directing, and possibly even physically moving the biochemical factory. So that's a very important idea. So imagine, hmm, what should you imagine? I'm looking at, at the fan spinning. So the fan is what? Is electric motor. So there is electricity which uh, goes, creates magnetic field, which goes like in, in, uh, in circles, spins in circles. So especially step motors are great, great simple. So in a step motor, you get a magnet field, magnetic field, and then the magnetic field just turns like that, step by step, tuk, 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 tuk. And uh, the magnetic field spins the, 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 the fan. So I assume that can be done that is what is happening within the cell. So the cell is a biochemical factory. It produces a lot of things and transforms a lot of things. So basically you get oxygen and sugar and some other nutrients. You combine them together, create proteins and build out of the proteins, you build everything else. And uh, I s that's another mystery how it is organized and how it is happening in such a wonderful order. And we say that DNA is responsible for shaping the whole field around itself, within and around. So imagine the DNA in the nucleus of the cell, and this nucleus creates the, and, and it's, it's surrounded by cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, all the factories is, is, is working. So we assume that DNA and RNA possibly are shaping the electromagnetic field within the cytoplasm to control and drive, to control and drive the protein synthesis and protein modifications. All the biochemistry which happens in cytoplasm is possibly driven by the morphic field. So that's a very, it's not just a little bit of the field added on the side. It's more like, it's more like everything is, is controlled by, by the field. So chemistry is important, but the chemistry is controlled and driven by the field. So that's the, this link. So biochemical factory is defined by the field, which is defined by the DNA. And of course, you can say that if you remove the DNA, the factory still works, but for how long it works? It works a little bit and then it dies out. So, so we claim that DNA is important for shaping it. Uh, the main idea of morph uh, uh, body shape, which is mm, the morph is shape. So, so body structure, body shape, organ structure is defined by morphic field. It is a hypothesis. All right, not proven yet. As, uh, what has proven? What was proven already has have shown. So basically, we show that there are waves involved, and some of the waves are waves are UV wave, UV in U, in the UV range. But that's about it. We don't have a definite proof that DNA field, the DNA creates a field or that the DNA uh, 
field controls, controls body structure, it is still to be demonstrated. I think there are, might be some attempts, but I didn't say anything convincing. It's not, there is nothing to, that I can put here in, on a slide yet. So that is to be done. And if you control the chemistry, you possibly control by behavioral chemistry, which is basically all these hormones and uh, chemical messengers, cytokines, uh, neurotransmitters, and all other chemistry which is um, involved in behavior. And um, you wouldn't be surprised that morphic fields should interact with the mind interact with the mind and be a major player in making the mind happen. And an interesting uh, observation is that there is so much non-coding DNA in, in the genome. When we say non-coding, I mean, we mean a little pieces of DNA, little fragments of the DNA are coding for protein through RNA, DNA to RNA to protein. Some fragments are coding for uh, uh, RNA only, which is not translated to protein. So, and lots of biggest bulk of the DNA is not coding for, even for RNA. So uh, we, I think that maybe this, and, and what is interesting, the proportion of, of the genome, which is not coding and it's still there, is roughly the bigger for thinking organism, for mind-oriented organisms than the ones which don't have a lot of sophisticated behavior. So basically mammals have a lot of non-coding DNA in the genome and uh, plants, have some and simpler organisms like bacteria have almost zero. They have like bacteria have very little non-coding. I think it's possible to even create a bacteria without almost any non-coding DNA. So roughly we can say the more you think, the more you have a complex behavior, the more you have um, uh, non-coding. And uh, an important clue is that the humans are different from other mammals by uh, expansion of that also. We have expanded non-coding regions. So, so that's a nice connection from DNA to morphic field to the mind. Even more, uh, we would think that it is possible that the mind and DNA are directly linked and they're functionally connected. That will be the third part of the talk. Now, uh, let me th say that it um, resonates, it connects logically, it re re resembles the ideas from um, Eastern philosophy, Eastern spirituality, and from different shamanic healing ideas and from uh, esoterics and metaphysics. The idea of Morphic field responsible for body structure and biochemistry is uh, sometimes called the etheric body. The names could, could change, but the concept is there. So some sort of aura, uh, the frequency of aura or the part of the aura which is uh, responsible for body structure and biochemistry and health. Then there is another part which is responsible for emotions. So it, sometimes it's called emotional body. And there is a, another part of the field which is responsible for uh, my thinking, and it's sometimes called mental body. Again, the, the names didn't settle, so there are multiple schools which have different names. Now, uh, here is a, even more. So you wouldn't be surprised. I think it's everything I say already is somehow in the general understanding. And you, you already know that your field and your um, say thinking is connected to higher consciousness. And it's not just connected a little bit, in some way it is possibly connected very strongly. And even there is even a stronger idea that you cannot even think without having some of your 
a big part of your thinking process to be connected to higher or other dimensional or say some some sort of a field so you use some sort of a field to to store information and to process information especially emotional information it looks like it happens in the chemistry of the body but also it happens elsewhere uh in non-physical but uh, say some sort of uh, a field a field a resonance wave property field area okay and i'll talk a little more about that in a minute and also there is uh, an idea of of uh our body structure to be also recorded somewhere as an archetype in a collective morphing field so possibly it's not only the genome but also the the uh, collective archetype or collective morphic field which is contributing to the shape of our body and the chemistry so these ideas i learned recently from uh, from uh, Rupert Sheldrake. He doesn't mention DNA much, but he, he, he wrote a book, Morphic Resonance, and the first edition was 20, 30, 36 years ago. And, it's still, and, and there is a new edition, and he still talks about that. And I think he is great. And he has done some pretty definitive experiments, statistically proven that some of that is the, is the case. So again, uh, I mean, that's a part of the previous picture. Basically, mind is connected to individual field and collective. I divided it individual and collective. He doesn't pronounce it. It's more like in his uh, teaching, it's more a little uh, less pronounced that there is individual and collective, but implied. So, so when you talk, when you think you might use your field, and then you might also use the collective mind. Sometimes it's called Akashic record. Sometimes it's called human collective. But the idea of body structure to be developed outside of the genome is the first time I heard from from uh, Sheldrake, and I think it is uh, it's likely it is like because gen genome is not big enough to define everything about our biology and our, our, our chemistry. I think maybe uh, just giving you an example. You know, when you um, go to the store, sometimes you don't buy the don't hold the physical thing in your hand. Like if you want to buy a, a laptop in, a, in the Costco, you go to the stand, you look at the laptop, like a, a sample laptop, but then you grab a, a barcode and you go to the cashier and then you pay and then you get your own laptop. Like they give, you, give it to you in a new laptop in the box. So, so basically you use um, some sort of uh, a barcode to to get the real thing. And uh, and maybe I'm just giving you an analogy, maybe our genome is not uh, a record and library of all the information about the physical body. Maybe it's just a complicated barcode. And when you have that barcode, you go to the universal library and get your biochemistry and your shape of the body from the universal library. And it's really hard to tell one from another because we don't, uh, have too much access to this universal library um, experimentally, but uh, that concept makes sense to me, and I think maybe maybe there is some truth to it. All right. Uh, so I did a little bit in, in this area. So I published some papers on red light and um, therapy on mice, and I was I has shown that. Um, that um, you can uh, activate genes using red light and that uh, it affects um, your immunity a little bit. So, so there was some, uh, some, some, some research I've done. Uh, millimeter wave therapy is a very interesting um, way of um, treating it uh, between the uh, infrared and, and microwaves and it's uh, promising in many ways that it could be one of the important biological frequencies. And much of it is developed in Russia. Uh, UV experiment, I, we're doing experiment now. So basically the, the idea is that UV might be, that millimeter waves are, which are the waves of seven millimeter wavelength, electromagnetic, 
uh, might be affecting the DNA structure and uh, they might be biologically significant. And uh, then you treat the cells with um, ultraviolet and demonstrate that the DNA structure is, cha is different when, when the cells are pretreated with millimeter waves. And here is just uh, important waves. So ultraviolet here, uh, visible light here, infrared. Um, so therapeutic wavelengths are red light, uh, near infrared. Uh, slow, low UV is important. Millimeter waves are a nice candidate. Uh, and there is um, ultra high frequency, which is um, about one centimeter waves are important. Uh, then you have like microwaves, cell phones, Wi-Fi. So this, somehow this might be biologically important, but most of the people don't feel directly the effect. So it's, uh, it's not, if the effect is there, it's not obvious. So, so that's interesting. And obviously like there is um, something in the sound frequency. And uh, in the past there was also treatment with um, mm, uh, radioactive rays, so th th that also could be could be of importance. But um, I will skip this for now. Any questions so far? Uh, you can type. I can read your questions if you want. All right, I will keep moving. All right, part two: cracking the DNA resonance code. Mm. So why do you think there is a, a resonance code? Um, DNA could be a computer. It's not proven, but that's the main um, focus of our theory, that DNA is a computer. And uh, it is a program. And uh, again, a nice analogy is, um, is like Android is a little less than gigabyte and DNA is like three gigabytes of, of information. And uh, some of it runs, like some of it is ex expressed into RNA and other parts are silent. And also if you look at different cells, different cells have different, different parts of DNA open, different parts of DNA closed. Uh, DNA has a memory and the memory could be chemical. Basically some DNA is uh, methylated and some of that is unmethylated. So there is some way of uh, recording information. Um, there is possibly, uh, oops, there is possibly a read and write uh, way of, uh, certainly there is a chemical way of reading and writing on DNA, but we also claim that there should be a, a, uh, an electromagnetic or wave pattern which can be written and read from the DNA. Next is um, DNA uh, might have logic and there might be some uh, circuits and conditions. So if that, then that, and if not that, then not that. So it, we know that it happens chemically, but also it's possibly happening um, electromagnetically. And there is certain addressing, uh, there are addresses in the DNA. Just a second. And um, oh, there is um, a way to search and the DNA is exceptionally good in searching. Uh, enzymes find proper places with amazing specificity. And uh, possibly the DNA pairing is important for searching. And then uh, there is an idea of uh, fractal and holographic nature of the DNA. Okay, uh, so talking about holographic principle, as if I understand it correctly, uh, one is, uh, uh, well, the main principles of holographic principle is that there is uh, redundancy. Basically one piece of the hologram contains um, the information about the whole, whole, whole hologram. And also um, there is a damage tolerance. So if you take a little piece of a hologram, it will, uh, if you damage a hologram, it still projects. And also, um, I think the hologram is uh, usually implied that it is read by um, using, it functions and read and understood using the resonance 
principle, resonance path. So it's interference, wave interference uh, mm, deciphering of the hologram. Uh, but here uh, is the digital uh, QR code, and also it is very sense, uh, very uh, mm, um, resistant, very resistant to the modifications. So if you can, you can make it fuzzy in many ways. You can make uh, add information. You can type over it, and it still can be. There's an exact uh, mm, how they say samples of barcodes which were. Um, uh, which are still legible. So I think that's a good illustration how the DNA could be a hologram and could be understood even though it um, it can be, a, uh, you know, you don't access the whole DNA at once. Small parts of DNA still contain a lot of the information. So the information is basically distributed and although DNA is linear, it's dis the information is distributed over the resonant information there. Uh, resident code is distributed over the uh, genome. Uh, the fractal principle in DNA is uh, interestingly, it has been around for a while. It hasn't been exactly proven, but it's nice to notice that an alternative science, French scientist, Dan Winter is uh, very big on DNA fractals. He talks about DNA fractals and the main idea of the fractal is that mm -hmm you have uh, bigger parts proportionally um, representing the small part. They are uh, just scaled versions of each other. So it's not exactly the mirror, it is more like a lens. You, the bigger part and the, the bigger structure, the small structure, they are uh, homologous, homologous with a certain factor. And um, Dan Winter is uh, very big on golden mean ratio. So he talks about the, uh, mm, fractals in the, in the nature, and especially fractals of that shape in the uh, DNA in human body. And recently I noticed there was uh, Eric Lander is one of the fathers of the human genomics, a very mainstream scientist. And usually he publishes the papers which are becoming mainstream about 20 years later. He has that wonderful talent to collaborate with people and to publish something which is uh, which will become mainstream. Mm. I noticed that when we started studying epigenetics, we used his paper, which was published 20 years before. When we started doing <clears throat> advanced genetic analysis using uh, SNP haplotypes, it was published by Eric Lander 20 years before. And now uh, in 2009, he published a paper about DNA fractals. Very mainstream computer analysis, but um, he is also into that. So it's a very good sign. So I think fractals is also important. Hmm. Now, uh, the four functions of DNA resonance. DNA resonance might work in the nucleus, in the cytoplasm, on the body level, doing the shape of the body of the organs, and in the brain. And this picture you already seen, seen, like body structure, biochemical factor, biochemical, behavioral chemistry in the mind. So it kind of just in, in enhances the same idea. Now, candidate structures for, res uh, for, for resonance. Mm, here we have trouble because only, the only ordered structure is uh, the primary DNA double helix. It's pretty orderly. <coughs> then it uh, is uh, wrapped around the nucleosome. It's also reasonably orderly. Then a pair of nucleosome, and then there is a tetranucleosome, which is still a pretty nicely defined structure, but also although much more flexible and less defined. And at that stage, as the research shows, and I believe it, experimental data shows that after that, the DNA structure is uh, not orderly, not evenly shaped. There is no, no periodic, it's not a periodic, there is no periodicity. So all the structures starting from, from here are uh, uh, a mess, a soup, a mess. So somehow, um, so we think that for resonating the structure should be similar and should, there should be some, some pattern like double helix, a wonderful resonating pattern. But if you go to bigger, maybe a tetranucleosome is the biggest of resonating structures. Although we think maybe there is more, it just, 
that you have to have uh, the resonance, not of the structure, how it is folded, but more like the double helix can be pretty long. So if it is a, a long double helical structure, maybe the whole chromosome can resonate, but only through the helix inside it. Inside of it, there is a perfect order, but outside it is a mess. So, um, so one turn nuclear, uh, importantly, like one, one turn of the double helix is about 10 and a half nucleotides, 10 and a half monomers. So if you want the resonance to depend on DNA sequence, it doesn't make sense to look at the smaller fragments. Like if you look at the size of which is, sizes which are smaller than one nucleotide, uh, the, nu the sequence of the DNA wouldn't be able to express itself there. It's, it's too small. So you cannot read the book by looking at one letter. You expect to some, some code to be recorded in groups of letters starting from three and then to six and nine and, uh, and then maybe even uh, 100,000 letters still would make some sense. But most interesting language is possibly at the level of our sentences, basically maybe 10, 20, 30 letters would, would, would make some sense and there are some parts and and then and, and the genes are about thousands of letters so maybe those resonances also are important now what, when they talk about resonance code what do we mean uh, this is actually the first time i uh, pronounce it so it could be a historical event that um, i pronounce what the resonance code is and uh, i define it so there is a, an algorithm uh, between the sequence T T G A C C C G T, and so on, three gigabytes of sequence. There is an algorithm which would uh, tell you which of the species is it. Is it a human or a mouse? So, so far this algorithm is not found, but I believe it is possible to find it by looking at resonance principles and uh, the main principle is that similar structures resonate, similar structures. If one structure vibrates, other structure gets, if it is the same shape of the structure, it will get in the same vibration. So they will start uh, resonating coherently. So there's a principle. And to, uh, the analogy for that is that if you take a barcode, you can read what it is. Uh, so you can code I did, uh, I did use the website, so I did, took dnaresonance.org, my site. I um, barcoded it. So barcode, you cannot read by eye, but there is an algorithm how you can decipher one to another. So we need an algorithm, mathematical program principle, how we read um, the genome into its function. So how to crack the resonance code? Um, the principles are experimental genomics, spectroscopy, uh, quantum chemistry, modeling, and computer, computational genomics and linguistics. Um, let me see if what's next. Yeah, uh, so experimental genomics, basically we have wonderful tools. We can uh, modify the DNA. We can take some something out or put something in and we take cells and then if we can measure the waves and if we can amplify the waves, if we can uh, show that uh, changing the wave patterns uh, correlates with certain sequences, then it's a good clue for the defining the resonance code. So imagine we can find a sequence and I have some candidate sequences. So we take a sequence, we can isolate it, synthesize it and show that this sequence has, has a unique pattern. And then we say a recreated pattern and um, show the function of it and then that would be the main breakthrough into the resonance code. Nothing has been done so far in this area. I don't think, I don't know anyone who is working on that. So that is very new. Spectroscopy is uh, just part of it. If it takes synthetic DNA sequence, if we show that uh, different sequences have different patterns, if we can recognize these patterns, it will give us terrific clues to, to decipher and crack in the code. Quantum chemistry model, and basically, I believe the main resonance, resonances use not the macro level of uh, waves, and same relates to Constantin Mayo. There is a quantum, quantum chemistry involved. Basically, 
main resonances happen on quantum chemical level. And the laws are there, like, are borderline between elementary particles, which are tiny, and the macro level, which is us, somewhere in between on DNA level, which is, um, I would say, between 10 micron and one nanometer. So nanometer, micrometer level. Um, there is a quantum chemical principles, which are like uh, tunneling, entanglement, um, <laughs> you name it. Um, again, special types of resonance, special type of um, uncertainty principle, special type of quantum chemical uh, electron clouds, elementary particle clouds. So, so it is wave and particle duality which, which plays there and uncertainty principle is very strong there. All right, so quantum chemical modeling, when we play with the DNA structure, we can predict how two structures with possibly different sequences, but similar quantum chemical properties can be similar. So I think that's a very strong approach, just by theoretical work. And computational genomics, basically looking at the DNA sequence and asking the question, where, where is the resonance? Nobody is doing that so far. It's uh, doable, but uh, it's uh, an area for grabbing. And also, you know, we already have a lot of annotations in the genome, and it is possible to analyze those annotations by uh, comparing them to the resonance hypothesis. So this is just um, that idea kind of um, how you combine different methods, annotations of the genome, basically what we already know about it. Transcriptome is what we know about transcripts, RNAs of the, in the genome. Nuclei, nuclease accessibility is opening and closing of the, of the different parts of the genome. It's also mapped and in the public domain. So this is up to grabbing. Experimental genomics, we can manipulate and read what we what we got. Spectroscopy is synthetic fragments in the spectroscope, looking at the waves, and also activating the sort of waves. Molecular structures resonate. Main principle and um, quantum chemistry molecular modeling I just described. So, if you combine that together, it's possible to crack. I think it's it's do very doable, and no one is doing that so far, as far as I know. All right, so the, who, who did it in the past? Um, Marshall Nuremberg in 61 did crack the first letter of DNA code for proteins. So he took the very simplistic synthetic polyribonucleotide. Unfortunately, it's very unstable. So, so it was hard to get it, but when he got it, he fed it to the, he knew what he was doing. He designed experiment exactly to, to get the answer. And these two guys, um, he and his postdoc, Michael Nuremberg and his postdoc, uh, fed the poly U RNA into the uh, cellular machinery and uh, the cellular machinery synthesized phenyl, phenylalanine amino acid. So basically the first letter of the code was UUU and they, got, they found which, uh, which uh, letter of the code was um, which amino acid was coded by this, by this. So, so how the DNA tran tr translated into protein was, this, was the first letter was cracked in 61. And then in a year or two, the uh, collective society of uh, scientists uh, cracked the rest of the letters. It was just a matter of how much money you pour and how much labor you pour and you, you can crack it. So, Cracking the first letter is important. Uh, Watson and Creek, it's a wonderful story. What was interesting, so Marshall Nuremberg was uh, funded, federally funded, he actually worked within the, within an NIH, National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. So <clears throat> I, I was on his lecture. So, so that was very mainstream. And then NIH poured lots of money to get the, the mm, to, lots of resources to get the priority and the protein code. Watson and Crick um, in 52 discovered double helix. That was just the opposite. Um, Watson basically um, 
was a postdoc. He had to cheat a little bit to get his um, postdoctoral money. He didn't tell what, what he was working on. And then when he told what he was working on, working on uh, he got the order from, from the federal American bureaucracy to stop and to go elsewhere. So he actually, I think he, um, he was using his savings to continue working on DNA structure. So he wasn't actually even funded by the NIH at the moment he, he, he discovered it, co-discovered it. And um, also Francis was, um, was told by his boss to work on something else. So he, it his, was a hobby kind of in free hours to work on DNA when, when he was told to work on a, a protein structure of hemoglobin. Anyway, uh, at the last moment, he got the permission to work on that. And then, so there was some legality in what, it, what they were doing, <laughs> but it was done largely underground. And um, for uh, the key for their discovery was to understand where the others got it wrong. So in our case, it's the same thing. It's uh, understanding where the others got it wrong. <clears throat> uh, Rosetta Stone, uh, 18, 22 by Champollion and Thomas Yan. Uh, finding there the stone where uh, Egyptian language was translated into two other languages was the key. And then understanding you can actually read it. So Thomas Yan pioneered, he, wrote, he, he read the first words and first letters and Champollion was the one who actually uh, was able to read lar large part of the text. Uh, in, in several years, he, he was able to decipher the rest. So you see, they can read A, B, G, and D. Um, these are Egyptian hieroglyphs, which uh, quote for this. So having, um, so for us, uh, this Rosetta Stone would be the genome annotations. And possibly we could also uh, play with some spectroscopy and see how different DNA sequences, how they spectroscopy, uh, different, uh, their light and wave properties, how they're different. So that would be the, the, the key for them. So multiple sources would bring the same information. Uh, Craig Venter is interested in different ways. Um, so <clears throat> he was able to bring uh, private money to do, to, to basically um, compete with the um, government money and uh, do the genome very fast. So that's more like an idea that um, you don't really have to uh, ask for federal money to do the research. Private money are just as good if you do it right and you just hire good people. And I think he hired a team of about 50 people and lots of robots. So it, it was lots of money put into robotics and then just by smart um, plan and um, good technology and lots of good technology, they were able to beat the, the uh, mainstream project. And so they made alternative project and they produced the mouse genome and the human genome and, uh, and many other genomes very fast. So the human genome project, the mainstream one had to catch up. And uh, I don't know if the investors actually got their money back. Um, it's really dependent how you play, but, uh, you know, they expected that when you read the genome, you would know everything. And the genome was read, as you see, 17 years ago, but uh, it's still very poorly understood. So they are looking just in the wrong place. They were looking at coding sequences. And my message is, and not only my message, Montagnier was saying that you got to look at the non-coding um, sequences and they got to look at the resonance and then it will be a gold mine. So, so the genome is there, we just need to read it. Uh, I mean, the sequence is there, we need to understand how to read it. And uh, again, I'm not against the, uh, the private money and investments. It's, I think it will pay off. Now, how much effort is needed to crack the DNA resonance code? I, th I say, you know, I put the number using like, in my, in my, exp in my experience, I think, uh, if I got a group of five dedicated postdocs for five years, I think we could, should be able to crack at least first several letters. And then it, the avalanche will go from there. 
And again, we need an, an expert in computational genomics, an expert in experimental genomics, an expert in quantum chemistry, and an expert in physics, and an expert in uh, spectroscopy. And we are in a unique position because we know where, where the others got it wrong. So if you just take random people, tell them to do that, I don't think they will get far enough because a lot of, there are a lot of uh, incorrect, incorrect presumptions in, in the mainstream. So you have to really do lots of homework to, to get it, to get the theory right. And then you can really crack it. Um, so the applications, that is a familiar picture from, from above. Now, uh, one application is obesity, body structure. So if you can change the, if you use morphic field, if you synthesize proper morphic field, you can change the body structure. So you can uh, treat obesity. You can possibly treat cancer. It is known that cancer produces, cancer tumor isolates itself from the body electromagnetically and electrically. And uh, it produces its own special frequencies to recruit more of the resources. Not only chemically is different, it's electromagnetically it is different. So possibly it's a clue to treatment of cancer. And a big thing is organ engineering. So when you understand the language of morphic field, you can talk to the organs in their language and possibly you can guide them to grow inside the body or you can grow them outside the body, giving them proper electromagnetic environment and then plant them in the body. So organ engineering could be a good application. Um, immunity is actually big in electromagnetic frequencies, arthritis, allergy. So it's all about controlling biochemical factor using electromagnetics, allergy and infections. And it's all electromagnetic drugs. Basically you recreate the proper waves using electromagnetic devices and I call it electromagnetic drugs. You don't take it, you take it through the waves outside, not invasively. There is a lot of, um, I think it's in the next slide. There is a lot of already electromagnetic devices developed. So, but they are developed without knowing the language. So one, once we get the language, that would be a revolution in electromagnetic uh, pharmacology, I would say. So behavioral chemistry, if you can treat chemistry and behavioral chemistry with waves, then depression, schizophrenia, and PTSD would be cured or helped a lot. And then when you treat the mind, uh, obvious problems are Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And there's uh, just samples of um, devices which don't use the DNA, but use it's a millimeter wave device. Uh, so you can apply them from, from outside and you send the, the waves inside and you get interesting if results. Small, small messages, small electromagnetic messages produce a lot of effect. Any questions so far? Uh, I got only so in the previous slide, in the previous slide, we concluded that there is a lot of biomedical implications, implications and applications. And now the most important implication is the brain code. So as you see, according to our theory and according to, I would say, uh, inconclusive evidence and hints and conjecture, uh, DNA morphic field has a good connection to the mind. So I go to the next, just highlight that connection, DNA morphic field mind, and of course it's back and forth. So once we crack the DNA code, it looks like we will have a good hint on the brain code. So DNA resonance code could be directly interacting with the brain code. And that's um, very easy to understand for outsiders, but for the mainstream, there is like a technical problem here. Let me see if I can get to it. Yeah, the technical problem is that a neuron is big. Like some of neurons are start in the spine. They're called dorsal root ganglia and they go, the body of the neuron, the DNA, the DNA uh, in the nucleus is in the spine and it reaches to the hand and we have the sensory endings of the same cell. It's one cell, it's about one meter long. So the, the sensation happens really far from the DNA. And the DNA is also surrounded by 
uh, the nuclear wall, nuclear wall, which is a uh, highly charged, polar charged, by, there are like hundreds or thousands of volts of charge in it. So the electromagnetic waves have, would, would have some trouble penetrating the wall. So DNA is insulated, isolated electrically from, electromagnetically from the outside. So main action happens through traveling action potential. It's electrophysiological term, but basically electricity, electrochemical things happen. The, the chemical, electrochemical signal travels from the spine, from the brain to the spine, from the spine to the, to the muscles and from the sensory neurons to the, to the, um, from the sensory neurons to the brain through action potential. So action potential is important, of course. It is our movement, our thinking, big part of our thinking. If you block action potential, things don't work. So action potential is huge. And it's unclear how would action potential, electric activities in the outside of, in the neural membranes, uh, cell, cellular membranes, how would they talk to the DNA? There is no clear mechanisms, mechanism until now. The mainstream, I don't think anybody actually is working on resonant, resonance, resonant communication between action potential of the brain, action potential of the neuronal, neurons in the brain and resonance in, in DNA because mainstream is oblivious of DNA resonance, nobody's looking at that. In the alternative field, people just assume that without actually doing experiments. So, so nobody's looking at that. But if you pay attention to DNA resonance, and if you pay attention to morphic field, the interaction should be huge and important. Luckily, there, is some, there are some clues. And um, Stuart Hammerov is, um, and, and his co-workers, co-authors, Pentrose and uh, others, um, are working, working on resonance from, through, through microtubules in neurons and side, outside of neurons. And uh, they, they made a big, big splash in the field, explaining for the first time is, uh, they produced pretty a pretty decent explanation of consciousness as a collapse of wave function, continuous repetitive ongoing collapsing of the wave function. Uh, I wrote to Hamerov, he responded, but, um, but the conversation didn't continue. So, so at some point he stopped responding. So I'm not sure why I think he has lot, lots of on his plate. He, did, he, does, he cannot take on too much responsibility of communicating with me, but um, I think he's, he's absolutely great. I would love to communicate with him more. So he has very good ideas and he even mentioned, he published something on DNA as well. So, so microtubules and DNA resonance. Now let, let's we'll go into detail. So he talks about microtubules being in their neurons and transferring some sort of electromagnetic or at least uh, quantum quantum information. When we say quantum, we mean maybe it's unmeasurable electromagnetic field, but there is some quantum chemistry involved in transfer of the information. So quantum chemical information. But I would say microtubular transmission, that would be a good word. So there are wonderful, um, pretty structures, spiral, not spiral, helical structures, which, which are as pretty as DNA in, in a way that they are perfect. And uh, these are in neurons, and for the proper neuron function, these are absolutely necessary. So, Hammer have started talking about that maybe 30 more years ago, maybe 40 years ago, publishing. And since then, he made a big um, splash in progress. Not too much evidence, but at least lots of good progress in theory, and uh, delivering it to the public was done. So, there is an important transmission of information. Not too well proven, but microtubules are important. And the idea, so the fact that microtubules are important is a solid fact. 
mainstream accepted. But that there is a resonance transfer of information in microtubules that is, there are some experiments illustrating that, but not too well reproduced, not too well understood. Uh, so I, I would, I think the, it's, it's not, a, it, it needs to be proven more, more thoroughly and published more thoroughly. That's a good statement. Okay, so the fact that microtubules connect to the nucleus electromagnetically. I didn't see it published. So it is possible that we are first to publish it. So I published it online, self-published it online this year. So it's there, it's not too well pronounced, but it's the picture is there. It's like a few sentences saying that. So, so maybe, maybe this is the first time I did it, but it's kind of obvious when you ask that question, but microtubules kind of go to to the nucleus surrounded, and there is a possible resonance, electromagnetic resonance between the DNA inside and microtubules outside. And on the other end of neuron, um, on the other end of neuron, um, there is possible some electromagnetic connection between inside of microtubules and other neurons or inside microtubules and outside microtubules. So interestingly, Outside of neurons, there is a lot of other microtubular structures which go around the body. And uh, there is a notion, I don't know how strong it's known, but that um, connective tissue, which is not neurons, connective tissue is uh, some, when you, if, if, you, if you eat meat, if you eat chicken, you can see the connective tissue between the skin and the muscle, between the muscle and the bone, within the muscle. So there is a lot of connective tissue and it's sort of, children consider it yucky and some adults consider it yucky, but apparently it might be the, one of their additional layers of information transfer. So muscles are wrapped in the connective tissue. Things are wrapped in and are like layers white layers of connective tissue everywhere. And maybe these are a pretty good indication that those are the tissues which are treated by acupuncture. So when your acupuncturists put their needles, they try to target this, this connective tissue. And this needle become antenna to connect this, this uh, connective tissue layers to their, uh, some outside fields using the needle, which should be metallic, should be conductive. All right, so, so there is a lot of interesting thing happening. So outside are also microtubules. So, so that's basically the, the point here that DNA resonance has direct connection May, might have direct connection through microtubules to the work of the neuron. So neuron is working through action potential that's outside through the membrane here, through the membrane, traveling electric, electric uh, waves of electrochemical activity. And this is important for movement and sensation for sure. Inside of neuron, microtubules also transfer some information. That's a hypothesis. And possibly this is the same information which is transferred in, uh, in plants which don't actively move, don't actively sense, but still there is some information transfer. And in mushroom networks, which are called mycorrhizal networks. So there is something very interesting. So it looks like there is a whole layer of additional connectivity, conductivity, signal transduction, which is, missed by the mainstream science and discovered, actually discovered or popularized by Hammer of Pentrose. And uh, if we talk about the brain code, maybe we should talk about DNA resonance and microtubular transduction and action potential as three, diff three processes that come together. All right, so um, 
uh, this is our main picture. And from this, we um, just leave higher consciousness, mind, morphic field, DNA. So what we want to say is brain function is um, uh, holographic. It's distributed over the brain. And it is known to mainstream science. If you take, take out part of the brain experimentally or through trauma, sometimes the brain function is not, um, is not disrupted. Connectivity is important, but the information is not, doesn't seem to be stored in a big, in, in locus by locus. It's, it's, it's distributed record over the brain. That's a consensus even by mainstream science. Fractality is likely, you can think about it, small DNA, big brain. So there is some sort of proportional uh, change of the size and, and maybe there is some fractality there. And uh, here is the idea that memory is, li is likely partly stored in morphic field. Um, why do we think so? Um, because uh, organ transplants sometimes transmit the memory from the one person to another. And it is possible that it's not the memory is transported, but uh, the barcode frequency. So you use your um, DNA, your body frequency to communicate with the morphic field. And uh, if an organ is transmitted from one person to another, then that barcode is transmitted. So that person starts picking up that record from the morphic field. It's, it's not proven, but there is, um, here and there is a lot of indications pointing towards that case. So not all of the mind is in the mind. It looks like initial processing is happening physically in the mind. Intuition comes from the morphic field. And then during the sleep, you convert your local local information and put it elsewhere in the storage in the cloud. Yeah, the cloud is a good analogy. Like uh, we started, everyone had a floppy disk and then we had a hard drive in a computer. And now instead of working in the, in the computer, you work in the cloud, there is a lot of information, information stored in the cloud. Um, I record this video in the cloud right now. So, and you are somewhere in the cloud. So lots of activity happens in the cloud and this higher consciousness and morphic field are just local cloud and remote cloud um, and the mind is working by making some work locally and then uploading it to the cloud and downloading things from the cloud. What else do you say? It's, it's, um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, once you, you, once you start thinking about it, there is no direct proof yet, but there is, a lot of proof that something is happening. Uh, some information is transferred back and forth. And um, the best experiments here are extrasensory perception experiments, near death experiences, um, and experiments by uh, Sheldrake, which I mentioned before, where he did um, say uh, experiment, very well controlled, semi-automatic, the volunteer, um, so the experiments of uh, basically simplistic telepathy. One of the best telepathy uh, perceived by humans is uh, when you can guess who is calling. So some people, volunteers who already believe it, it's, it's true, they pick four friends who also participate. So five people participate. And then uh, at some point the receiver uh, receives a, an automated phone call and say, and it says, uh, if you think it is calling subject one, friend one, press one. If it's two, press two. If two, four, three. If it's John, press four. And then you press it. And then only after that, you hear who is calling. So there is immediate readback, feedback. Uh, you know if, if you guessed it right or not. So they did that experiment and showed that it's way beyond random. So people can actually feel who is calling pretty well. It's not 100% guess, but it's uh, but statistically certainly not random. It's not, it's not that they don't guess. So, so there is a huge, huge statistical effect, which is uh, I think like one in a billion or something. 
So this kind of experiments demonstrate that there is a way to, to communicate between the mind and the other mind. So that's basics of telepathy. And we assume it, you know, Sheldrake called it morphic field, but basically some sort of a field which allows the transmission of information, non-physical because you can even do the guessing, like especially in ESP, extrasensory, extrasensory perception experiments, they did the reading, even if their reader, a sensor uh, perceiver, uh, if it is, uh, he is like underground in a bunker, electromagnetically shielded, you still get the signal. So it's, it's in some sort of a field which is not a typical electromagnetic field. All right, uh, how to go about, here is a mistake, how to go about cracking the brain code or how to crack the brain code. So I assume it's based on the DNA code. So there is interaction between DNA and brain code. This is new, I don't think anybody pronounced that boldly. So this is new. So experimental genomics is an approach where you manipulate the genome and then you see if the, the the brain code changes. So that can be done on mice, on uh, anything that has a brain, but also, it, mm, yeah, like Drosophila, uh, what other simple organisms like our chicken, I would say, fish. Yeah, fish would be good. You can do it on fish. They have some, some sort of a brain. So you can see if you can modify the brain code and uh, I don't like doing that on even on human cells because then the field from the cells can affect you. So I don't like that. It should be done pretty cleanly with, with some model organisms. And then uh, there are candidate sequences. As I said, um, humans have unique candidate sequences, which are even different between humans and uh, other primates. So this would be a great candidate sequences for humans. So we can look at them. All right, um, implications. So I mix here positive and negative. So physical therapy for psychiatry. So if we know the code, we can treat psychiatric problems. Negative, mind control. The work on my, works on mind control have been reviewed by Richard Allen Miller in the paper Synthetic telep telepathy and some other papers. And um, they have been around for a long time. And um, uh, it's very likely that the, the defense scientists have very advanced technology, developed very advanced technologies for mind control. It can be used for manipulation of masses, for manipulation, manipulation of individuals as uh, enemy individuals as, uh, as uh, and also by manipulation of your uh, soldiers and uh, whoever you want. So it's, it's a very pro profound thing. Um, also mind enhancement, it's, uh, it's a dream of everybody. Not everybody, but many. It's scary, but it's possible. And um, just listen to a talk which is uh, called Nine Volt Nirvana by uh, Radio Lab. Nine Volt Nirvana. So it, it, it's happening already. There is a, a very simple device which you can create for $25 and put on your head and it will improve your uh, uh, precision of your, some of your um, complicated actions physical actions and also learning ability. I, I don't say it, it is, uh, it goes, it doesn't have, I don't know if there are side effects, but usually for any improvement you get side effects. So I don't endorse it. Uh, creation of cyborgs is um, pronounced by many defense uh, grants and also by NIH grants, federal health grants, and also by private foundations. So that's going full steam. And uh, uh, I mean, 
how you define cyborg. Basically creating brain computer interface and sometimes uh, it is non-invasive, but mostly it is invasive. Technology assisted telepathy. Mm, it has been developed and again used for positive and negative purposes. Oh, everything is already on the way. So cracking the brain code implications just sorted by negative and positive. So mind control, electromagnetic dope. So basically you can possibly create a electromagnetic drug which would make you happy without taking any chemical drugs. That is a possibility. I'm, I'm, I'm not aware if it is really already done, but there are some discussion groups when people try to do that like voluntary. Uh, now, uh, cyborgs, um, I don't know if it's positive or negative, but it uh, can be negatively used by, without the agreement of the person, they, you know, as they did in uh, Star Trek, Borg, um, seven, of, uh, eight, seven of nine. Yeah, seven of nine was, uh, without her consent, she was converted to, to a, a cyborg. All right, so these are negative things and these are pretty profound, especially if you think about that it's already happening and it's very close to becoming more profound, more pronounced. Now I claim here, and it is something new, which is new to me as well, that telepathy is another implication, which is greatly positive. Let me see if I, yeah. Uh, so telepathy is uh, coming and it could be natural telepathy and, uh, and technology assisted telepathy. And I say that uh, telepathy is, uh, is a very positive development, even if it is technology assisted. So telepathy will enable telepathic communities. So voluntary people could put on the helmets or whatever device it is. And when people uh, start communicating telepathically, the communication become becomes much clearer. And as far as I know, and I'm pretty sure that good telepathy removes deception and removing deception also will uh, remove deceptive leaders. So within the telepathic community, deceptive leaders have no chance. And I think that's the main problem with the communes that deceptive leaders take uh, hold of them. If, uh, if deception is not a, an option, then uh, it will be more tribal, more communal without actual, uh, I would say, takeover by negatives. All right, uh, altruism and true cooperation. So when people really uh, don't deceive each other, when they speak their mind, they have to clear much, uh, think much clearer. So their minds are clearer, they like only positive people can survive and telepathic community. Uh, and negative people would uh, be immediately so as they are and uh, they would have to change. And it will improve learning and communication. Basically, I assume telepathy is like um, upgrading from your slow speed uh, internet to very high speed internet. You First you get the information faster and then it becomes much less distorted. So words are prone to distortion. And telepathy, a good telepathy is, um, should be a very clear channel. So far we don't have that. So we, we, we don't have experimental proof that there is a clear telepathy. There are psychics and psychic channels are even uh, more uh, distorted than um, word channels. But still uh, I believe that uh, with good telepathy it will be other way around that telepathic connection would be much cleaner and error proof, much more error proof than uh, communication by text and words. Um, improve the teamwork. So when a team connects into a hive, into a tribe, into a um, collective with clear uh, communication between the members, then um, teamwork will become way more efficient and people will be more cooperative. And uh, eventually when the humanity unites, at least part of the humanity unites, say 1% of the humanity over the globe, we are now united through that, through the internet and through Facebook. But if we unite in a telepathic connection, 
this will lead to a dimensional jump. Um, it's like um, condensation of gas into the water or condensation of the water, hardening of the water into the ice or any other where individual members become interlinked, it will be a dimensional jump. So uh, that happened to the alien civilizations as far as uh, many sources tell. So I think that's the only way forward for the humanities to telepathically connect, telepathically connect and um, create this dimensional jump. So this is a very positive development and uh, I believe this will solve the political problems and economical problems and ecological problems, social problems, family problems. Um, when people become true to each other and stop deception and communicate clearer, that will solve a lot of problems and humanity will survive through telepathy. So brain computer interface needs the brain code so, so far brain computer interface have been funded, but they don't have the brain code. Uh, so cracking the telepathy, brain, uh, DNA code and brain code would greatly help. Uh, and this is where the interests of the military might be in line with the interests of the humanity. I know that is uh, a statement which will be not liked by anyone say, uh, when I worked in a commercial company with some experienced industry scientists, there was a meeting and I mentioned, actually I pronounced pretty clearly that it is very nice that we are doing that, this kind of work. It was a genomic work, genomics work because it will help people. And I saw that people, the scientists looked at me uh, with judgment and they didn't like what I said. Apparently in, a, in, a, in industry, it is a taboo to put the interests of the customers or interests of the humanity, actually interests of humanity uh, ahead of the interest of investors. So everything you do in, a, in the industry, like in traditional uh, modern society, modern industry is uh, you have to really put the interest of the company ahead of interest of the humanity. So if you mention the interest of humanity, it's a, it's a bad, uh, bad thinking. They really didn't like it. And if I finally got fired and I think in part because, because of that. So same thing with the military. I don't know, but I assume that, you know, they would hate to be doing something which is not negative, but actually helps humanity, at least uh, openly. But I, I also I assume there will be a lot of good people there who just happen to be stuck in that position or chose that position because they believe in the interest of humanity and they might appreciate that sentiment. So here the interest of your humanity to have telepathy and to make a dimensional jump, to remove this deception uh, would be actually supported by some of the, of the, of the villains of the military. Um, I remember reading about or listening about ESP program where uh, academics uh, put off and others uh, were reading the minds and uh, reading uh, the information from elsewhere. So some of the uh, officials, defense officials with uh, high clearance, high secrecy clearance, refused to come and talk to, in contact with these guys because they didn't want to reveal any of the secrets in their minds. And the secrets could be the official secrets or personal secrets. So they would send some intermediaries which didn't have as much clearance and didn't have as much to reveal to communicate with the extrasensory perceptors. Uh, that is funny, I mean, <laughs> but I guess it's, it's absolutely real for them. And again, the, 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 uh, you guys who, are, who put the interest of humanity first, you would possibly hate to be, uh, to, for that research to be funded by, uh, by the defense and for defense to take the, to 
ripe the fruits of that research, but it, it is ripe anyway. So they, they already do in full steam research. And once I pronounce it, I, 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 I don't know if anybody else is talking about this right now. I assume not. I didn't, I don't see on YouTube, I don't see much said in this direction. I give here a very specific twist saying that genomics, experimental genomics, computational genomics are the key to DNA resonance code and to the brain code. And I don't think anybody is saying it now. It ha might have been pronounced in the past, but is, I don't know anyone who is openly publishing anything in that direction. So basically here I announce that the race is out. It is possible to do, I put the price on it. Five, postdo five dedicated postdocs in my uh, position will crack some of the code, not everything, but the first letters we should be able to crack pretty fast. And um, I think uh, if some, at some point that might, that wave might reach the people with the money and I think the race will start. And I have the lead time because I have some uh, understanding where to go and, and how to go about it. So, so if you just hire random people, you possibly would, it will take a long time, but I would say if it's not five years, maybe in five to 15 years, I would expect, expect that humanity will crack the code and hopefully the technology will be public and uh, public volunteers could learn the telepathy and that will change the, the history, I think. I hope. Otherwise, it's, uh, you know, it can be misused, of course. All right, the military mind control cyber and smarter teams. I mean, yes, the military do want, that's their claimed interest mind control, cyborgs. I don't think they claim to that they want smarter experts, but you know, they always wanted them. So I say here, you if you crack the brain code and develop uh, a harmless telep telepathy, then you can put it on your own teams and uh, make them smarter. This, the, <laughs> the side effects that, um, you know, the secrets will leak within the team. So they have to have the same security clearance. If you want to telepathically connect the people from your um, soldiers or whatever experts, they have to be the same security clearance. That's an interesting consequence. For humanity, basically it is um, the um, outcomes is altruism, cooperation, and the dimensional jump. Uh, this might be a historic event. That's the first time it is pronounced. And once it's pronounced, I don't think it can be stopped easily. Even if they stop me, they can stop themselves. They, they would possibly would uh, go there anyway. All right, approaches, how to go about it. I don't want to dis dis disclose all the, the ideas I have, but basically crack, cracking the brain code is one way, but not the only one way. Once you know it's there, you can develop the methods where you can transmit the information without knowing the code, like, like a messenger. You put the letter, give a message, the messenger carries the code. He cannot read Russian, but uh, he transmits the message. So transduction can be done without deciphering. Same thing with the phone, like the, the smartphone doesn't, doesn't necessarily understand what you say, but we can talk through the smartphone. Okay, uh, one good idea, it's kind of obvious and I really like it, uh, synchronizing the subjects, fine tuning the subjects uh, using biofeedback and possibly psychedelic drugs. So basically bringing people to a certain synchrony, harmony and coherence, at least two people. And um, I think it's good. Um, without knowing their code, you can still uh, amplify the natural telepathy this way. Then brain technology, brain interface, um, oblivious to the code, you don't know the code, but if you just help connecting the two brains together, you might enhance. So imagine two helmets, lots of electrodes just connected to each other. Maybe that is plenty or uh, light guides or 
electrodes and a little bit of amplification, whatever comes through, kind of kind of adjust. So you know, when you start brainstorming, it's I think it's pretty a pretty decent approach. So obviously, like you know, you can put a helmet connected to a cell phone. Another person, I don't know how um, what wavelength is there. Uh, we know the brain waves, but we don't know the frequency of brain waves is from roughly hertz to about 30,000 hertz, maybe 50,000 hertz. I mean, there are some works when they work on megahertz or possibly even higher, like a few gigahertz. Uh, millimeter waves are important. Um, light is important. So there is a lot of huge frequency, frequency range, but you know, main mainstream electrophysiology works between say 100 and 30,000 hertz, which is sound frequency. Sound frequency, but the electro, electric, electric activity. It's, it's quite possible. Uh, next, uh, brain biotech brain inter interface. It's kind of obvious, but if you possibly use microtubules to connect two brains, <laughs> and how you do that, it's, uh, it's, it's, it could be done non-invasively uh, and harmlessly. Obviously, like, you know, you possibly like, a great question. Um, if you have uh, two fish growing together, are they telepathic to each other? If they're glued together, like, if they're glued together, are they tele becoming more telepathic? If you hug without clothes, are you more telepathic or not? It's an interesting uh, research. I don't think anybody done that because the microtubules, the role of microtubules in telepathy wasn't pronounced yet. So, so, so that's what I mean, brain biotech, brain meaning connecting two people through biological transmitter like microtubules based on Hammer. If it's not, I'm just combining what I know from Hamerov to, to this problem. So these are very, very practical approaches. Uh, now, uh, what, where can you learn more about the dark side? It's more emotional than um, technical. So on the emotional side, I like movies. I recommend The Man Who Stared at Goats, 2009. It's a pretty scary movie, but it's made watchable. I was able to watch it without crying too much and without being scared too much. But uh, you know, when you think about it, it's, it's, it's very heavy. So here is, tell me more. I, I would invite the feedback if you can, can you tell me more where can I learn about ethical implications of the misuse of telepathy and brain code, I would appreciate. I, it's a new topic to me. I was not actively researching it until recently. So this is the dark side, you know, how bad can it go? And here is the bright side, a La Belle Vert, um, The Green Beautiful, 1996 French movie with, with subtitles. Um, that's, you know, how the telepathic revolution happens and uh, basically how the humanity can awaken to telepathy and make the dimensional jump amazing, wonderful, easy to watch. I also cried, but here it was a happy recognition, not the uh, scare. All right, um, I want to announce that I made a simple prototype for technology enhanced telepathy. It's safe and ready for testing. So I'm looking for a collaborator to get human subject protocol going. So I want to do it uh, formally, it's, there is an international convention, so you have to um, get it approved. It, because it's non-invasive, it's pretty pretty easy to get approved, but it is, uh, you have to go through a process and uh, get it formalized and then uh, test it on uh, pairs of telepaths or test it on pair of volunteers and see if telepathy testing is, um, is enhanced. And you need formalized test where you can statistically judge if the transmission is um, is uh, enhanced. And uh, here I thank you, and then I'm closing. I went over time, but it was important for me 
to do it for the first time, I will do it again. I will do this talk again and I will rearrange it to get the important messages sooner out sooner. Uh, you can find me, uh, email is the best way to communicate and also Facebook. So uh, maxadinandresin.org. And it's my own tiny company. We are looking for more funding. Uh, it's a nonprofit, but I have also a profit um, counterpart. So we, we're looking for investments or donors or federal funding. I know usually people who watch me, they don't have, have your own money, but you might know someone who might be interested in donating or investing or um, or maybe you have some uh, friends in their funding agencies. So I would appreciate the co connections. And um, I think um, we have something unique to offer here and uh, we can make a positive impact on, on the process. Of course, my, my, um, my uh, strong intention is to publish everything right away. And this is what I'm doing right now. So. So we will patent and publish. It's, it's, it's gonna be academic and um, commercial way. I don't want any secrecy or any um, clearances. I wouldn't keep any secrets. Except, you know, when it's, uh, when it's investors, they want it patented first. But uh, again, um, Craig Venter was able to make a deal with the investors that um, they patented first, but then the uh, their patented office had um, some sort of independence and there was a six month um, time where the patent office had a chance to patent whatever they came out from the research and then it was all published uploaded to the public databases or semi-public databases so so um so i think that's a great principle and i i i want to follow that so and you know whoever does that i recommend read the book about Craig Venter and uh, uh, pick up his model. I think it's it's great. You sort of use private money, but but make a benefit for the investors and for the humanity. With that, I thank you, um, and um, I hope to re-record it sometime soon and um, and then write it up as a as a text paper and publish it one way or another. Have a good day. Uh, feedback, which which feedback I want. So yeah, what can I improve? And uh, if you can connect me to collaborators and people who can think in that direction, write to me and I would be very grateful. Now have a good day.